I'm not joking when I say this. If you are born in India and you come to the US and hope to get your green card through employment based category, well, there is no chance of you getting a green card now. If the per country cap is removed, the backlog will increase significantly for people from all the countries. And I have noticed this strange behavior by many desis online on social media. These people have loud and potty mouths. And because of that, they are ruining chances for others as well. They start abusing senators and congressmen and use bad language online. Well, think about it. If that senator sees your messages, do you think they will have a change of heart? And doing so, you are damaging the reputation of all people in your community. Well, the claim of not having freedom and slavery, in my honest opinion, is quite absurd. Why do I say in the title of this video that dangerous times are ahead? It is not an exaggeration if I say I am getting worried. Am I spreading gloom here? Maybe. But am I being truthful? To the best of my knowledge and understanding, yes, I am being truthful. Let me make this clear. I am not expressing my wishes here. I am only trying to explain the situation as it is. If someone does not like to hear the truth, it is easy to blame someone who is actually telling you the truth. I am only trying to explain the situation from a neutral perspective. For us to know how things got into such a bad situation when it comes to green card backlog, we need to go back in time. In the late 90s and up until early 2000s, all the people who came to the US and applied for a green card got it quite easily. There were per country caps on the green cards even then, but there were not enough people applying to fill those caps. But as the internet was spreading all over and people's awareness about the opportunities that they can get in the US was spreading, people in India realized that going to America is no longer a distant dream. People started realizing that going to America is a realistic possibility and people started exploring that possibility. More and more engineering graduates were joining the IT workforce. In the US on the other hand, more and more companies were trying to digitize their business processes. See, the number of companies in the US is very, very large and this large number of companies were Wanted to be very competitive and this large number of companies needed a large IT workforce to digitize their businesses. But then rather than hiring their own IT employees, they started hiring IT consultancy companies who had their own employees who they had already trained to work on these projects. At the time, companies saw IT as a separate business function and did not consider IT to be a part of their core business operations. Therefore, all these companies wanted to focus on their core competence and relegate the IT work to other companies particularly outsourcing companies from India. Initially, however, they relied on local companies such as IBM and Accenture. However, they realized that Indian IT outsourcing companies are much cheaper and therefore they decided to outsource their IT functions to these vendors in India. And these IT companies based in India were providing equally good service but at a much lower cost. And this low cost was largely driven by low labor costs. And this led to an explosion of job opportunities in IT sector in India. But given the difference in time zones and time differences, it was becoming quite challenging for companies in the US to work simultaneously at the same time with companies in India. Therefore, what these companies started doing is that they started to bring some of these IT workers to the US so that they can work live on site. And this is when H1B system came in very handy. Indian companies started sending more and more employees to the US. It was very profitable for both sides. While for the American companies, it was low cost labor which was also dispensable, Indian companies were charging good amount of money which was quite a good money by Indian standards. And now this was also a time where awareness about American education came about. Not everyone was going to get a job at Infosys TCS and work on a project and eventually be called to the US on H1B. There was a more direct route which was going to the US as a student. Until early 2000s, Chinese and Korean students were the largest group of international students. However, things started to change in early 2000s. Around 2005-2006, more and more Indian students started to come to the US. I think in 2006, Indian students were the largest group of international students in the US. And all these international students who came to the US, spent their money studying here, paid the fee, paid those living expenses, wanted to recover some of their costs, right? So they wanted to look for job opportunities here. And this is how people started realizing that going to the US as a student is a faster and a better route rather than going through H1B. Because as a student, you're exposed to the culture in a more broader fashion. You're taking classes, you have the advantage of American education and then joining the workforce in America. And soon after, the international students who were applying for H1B started to far exceed the number of H1B applications from workers who were working remotely from India. With these two sets of people applying for H1B, which is international students who studied here and those who were working in IT companies abroad who were applying for the same H1Bs, the total number of people was getting big. In fact, it was 
four times, six times, eight times more than the number of green cards that are available. And because so many people started applying for green card every single year, bottlenecks started to appear. So let me pause here for a second. If you are an international student in the US and if you are looking for a job and you have not succeeded so far, I may have some tips for you. Because international students do not have all that much time to look for a job. The clock is always ticking. And moreover, not all companies are willing to hire them because they need to sponsor their visas. A lot of positions are not even available for you if you are an international student. You must be really efficient with your job search process. You must be able to accurately narrow down the companies that you should apply for. And here is where an amazing platform called F1 Hire comes to your rescue. The way F1 Hire works is that you add it as an extension to your browser. You can use F1 Hire to streamline your job application process so that you can succeed in getting a really good job. And you can on the right side, you can see that your skills on your LinkedIn and your CV, how much do they match with this internship position? And I recommend that you use their premium subscription because it's just about $10 a month. And mind that it is not just LinkedIn. You can use this with other systems as well. But a great news here is that before you actually pay for the premium account, you can actually use this for one month for free. If you use my promotion code, how do you do that? Go to profile and add a promo code okay and the promo code that you need to use is desi american professor for dap dap 2023 remember that d a and p are all in capital letters okay so if you use this promotion code you can get subscription for a month the link to sign up for f1 hire and the promotional code to get free access for a month are given in the description below so go ahead and sign up for this wonderful platform so now, when and where did the problem with green card backlog start? See, when the US government enacted the immigration law, they made some rules. The rules they made were in line with American system and American ethos. For example, in the US system to maintain diversity of thought and diversity of power, they have a system of checks and balances. The spirit of checks and balances was that no one person or a community or an institution should become too powerful. There should not be any domination. For example, the US has three centers of power. The executive, which is the president, the legislative, which is the Congress and the Senate, and the judiciary, which are the courts in this country. And each of these three centers of power prevent one another from abusing their own power. The Congress can refuse to pass a law, the president can veto the law, and the Supreme Court can also come and interfere and prevent the law from being enforced. Similarly, look at the two branches of the legislative. On one hand, we have Congress, which reflects the majoritarian view of the country because more the population of a state, more the number of legislators who join the Congress, more the congressmen there are. However, Senate balances that power where each state gets two senators. No matter how big or small the population is, you can only have two senators. This way, the power of larger states is balanced by the power of smaller states because they have equal rights. Using this logic and spirit of the US Constitution, when the Congress enacted these laws, they made sure that no people from one country are going to dominate the workforce. Therefore, they imposed a 7% cap on employment-based green cards. The reason why no one country can get more than 7% of employment-based green cards is that it is a human tendency to favor people from your own community and your own background. Then why are there no caps on H-1B or student visas? Well, H-1B and student visas are temporary visas, whereas green card is permanent residence. If you think about this in a neutral manner, this is actually a sensible rule. The idea of per country cap was rooted in maintaining diversity in the workforce. The idea was to maintain fairness in the system. And for many years, it worked just fine. Nobody was having any trouble. Nobody was crying. Nobody was creating any issues because they were not getting green cards because not many people were filing for green cards. Imagine this. If today the government comes and passes a law that every family will get one bag of greens, then all the families have one or two members, let's say, or one or two more kids. And then if some families decide to have more children, if all other families have one to two kids, and there are some families that are producing eight, 10, 12 kids. And if then these large families start to complain that they are getting lower share, they are still getting one bag of grains, while other families that are much smaller are also getting one bag of grains. Therefore, to accommodate these large families, the government should give larger or more number of grains of bag. Will it make sense? Well, the government had established the rules before this problem even occurred. If the rule was placed before some families started to produce too many kids, the rule maker here is not at fault. If a large number of people from two or three countries try to immigrate, 
it can create problems for people from smaller countries. Therefore, those who applied for green cards in late 90s and early 2000s got lucky because they were the early birds that took the worms. Because the rule of 7% cap on each country was made much before the green card backlog problem started to appear. Another argument I have against people who are complaining that green cards are discriminatory and racist, the point is that no country is getting too many green cards but at the same time, remember that people from India are getting their full share of green cards. In fact, they are getting even a bit more. It would have been discriminative if people of India were not getting enough green cards and people from other countries were getting more green cards. That is not the case here. Whatever the full quota is, people are utilizing that and every year, possibly more Indians are getting green cards through employment-based category than any other country. But if the population of people who applied for green card is so large, Many people are bound to think that they have been left out. It is natural for them to think that the system is being unfair to them. And then I see many people claiming that this is lack of freedom, people are being enslaved. Well, the claim of not having freedom and slavery, in my honest opinion, is quite absurd. They call it slavery without even realizing in the context of this country what slavery even meant. First of all, slaves were purchased and they were forcefully brought in here. The slaves were kept in deplorable conditions and many of them died due to sickness. They were forced to work on the farms here and if they resisted, they were tortured to death even. And people today who claim that this is lack of freedom and slavery, all those people are living in nice apartments and houses. They are drawing some really good salaries. They are traveling happily within the country. They are all going out, hanging out with friends, going for movies, going for shows. They are going to restaurants, for parties. They are doing everything here. Yes, I understand that traveling outside of the US is pain. People have been forced to miss important events such as marriages, functions, birthdays, even funerals. But in spite of all of that, this is still not slavery. Because simply put, nobody is being forcefully brought in here. The fear of losing job does not amount to being a slave. And then we have people demanding for so long for removal of these country caps. They have got some support from congressmen and senators, but there are other senators and congressmen who also oppose this idea. And I have noticed this strange behavior by many desis online on social media. When I say desis, I am referring to those people who are stuck in backlog and are active on social media. A small minority of these people have loud and potty mouths. And because of that, they are ruining chances for others as well. They start abusing senators and congressmen and use backlog language online. Well, think about it. If that senator sees your messages, do you think they will have a change of heart? For example, if someone wants to oppose the Eagle Act, they are free to do so. That he's a senator of this country. He represents his constituents who are citizens of this country. You're not a citizen. You're not a constituent. You do not vote for him. He is not at all responsible for your well-being. If anything, it is a privilege that you have that you have the opportunity to be in this country. So rather than trying nicely and respectfully trying to change their minds, these people are using absurd and abusive language online. And such behavior will make these senators and congressmen only more averse to your well-being. And doing so, you're damaging the reputation of all people in your community. Therefore, I think that people should be respectful in their demeanor. For example, consider Dr. Raj Karnatak. He's active on Twitter and there is no drama in his tweets. There is no abuse. He's always respectful to people. He's always civil while at the same time, he puts his views with conviction. And because of this opposition to the Eagle Pass, the attempts to remove poor country caps have failed. And in my honest view, all these attempts to remove poor country caps will likely continue to fail. I do not see any chances of success here. The reason being that there is a system of lobbying in this country. If the poor country cap is removed, the backlog will increase significantly for people from all the countries. People from those countries who are getting their green cards in 1-2 to two years will also now have to wait for 25-30 to 30 years to get their green cards. Wait a second, did I just say 25-30 to 30 years? Yes. There have been so many applications from Indians and the backlog has become so huge such that if poor country caps are removed, it will ruin chances for everyone. While mostly Indians and some Chinese are screwed, if poor country caps are removed, everyone will be screwed. Therefore, people from other countries, in particular people from Iran, are strongly opposed to this idea of removal of poor country caps because for them, traveling outside of the US and coming back is much harder. It's much harder for them to get the visa. Therefore, removal of poor country cap will be a disaster for people from other countries. And I just give the example of people from Iran. There are many other countries that are smaller who will strongly oppose this idea of removal of poor country caps. And therefore, they will continue to lobby against any attempts to change this rule. So how bad is the situation? See, the worst affected because of this green card backlog issue are the children of these backlogged immigrants. 
the children who are about to turn 21 and they have no hope of getting their green cards on time. The bad news, however, is that even if per country caps are removed, the wait time will become 25 to 30 years for everyone and it is still greater than 21. So people will start to age out anyway. And what will happen is that children from other countries, citizens of other countries will also have to face a situation where their children will also start to age out. Right now, only people from India age out then everyone else will also age out. I'm not joking when I say this. If you are born in India and you come to the US and hope to get your green card through employment-based category, well, there is no chance of you getting a green card now. And before I discuss any solutions for this issue, let me make this clear that I think that the fight to remove poor country caps is already a lost battle. It is nothing but a waste of time for everyone. Even with removal of poor country caps, the wait time will be large for all people and by the time they get their green cards, they will be already past their retirement age. So I think there are only two practical solutions for this. If people born in India want to have any hope of getting a green card through employment-based category, the solutions are as following. The first step is removal of poor country caps. Yes. It is the first step, but it is not an entire complete step on its own. It is not a full solution. It is only a part of the solution. The second step is increasing the number of green cards available through employment based category by about eight to 10 times. Yes, I said it about 10 times more employment based green cards will need to be made available for people to have any hope of getting their green cards within one to two years after applying for it. If not these alternate solutions can be giving some kind of relief for aged out children. Giving them extended study permit or a work permit of some kind can be very helpful. Perhaps giving out green cards to highly qualified people such as doctors and those who have PhDs in STEM fields can be a good step. So my suggestion here is that rather than demanding big steps like removal of country caps or increasing the number of green cards, start with smaller steps. I think it is better to make demands that are more reasonable. Demands where lawmakers do not have to make heavy adjustments to come to an agreement. So my suggestion and my view is that making smaller demands such as ease of travel, relief for aged out kids and then faster green cards for those who are doctors and STEM PhDs can be more easily attainable. Because just think about it, what are the chances of big changes happening? I think next to none. And here we come at a point where we need to understand who are the people who are trying to resist such changes? Who are the people who possibly do not want any change in rules and are happy with the status quo? First guilty party could be the companies because these H-1Bs who are stuck in green card backlog have to be loyal to the company that they are working for, they are more easily exploitable. If an employee is tied to the company, the company has more power. The second could be lawyers. The more the number of people who are waiting in the green card backlog, they are a continuing cash cow. And that way it is possible that lawyers want to keep making money for an extended period of time. Third could be politicians obviously. The more the number of people stuck in the immigration backlog, more money people can make. Fourth possibility is USCIS. More the number of people who are stuck in green card backlogs, they have to keep renewing their documents, they will have to keep paying the fee. Fifth party are the immigrants from other countries who are not stuck in green card backlog. If per country caps are removed, the delay for people from other countries can become very high. Those people who are getting their green cards in one to two years, do you think they want to wait for 15, 20, 25 years? Obviously not. And the last category, believe it or not, People who do not want others to get green cards are people who have already got their green cards. They think that, yes, I'm done with the process to help with everyone else. So what if people from my own community and background are struggling in this backlog? Let me enjoy my own perks and use the system for my own advantage is how some people look at the situation. And this mentality honestly is quite sickening. Okay, so it is getting quite dark here. So let me know in comments what you thought about my views, what views of mine you agree with and what views you do not agree with. Thanks for watching. Jai Hind and may God bless the United States of America.